So I appreciate everyone joining today. We're going to talk about a, one of the first tools we've developed in Patrick, which is the protein family sorter. So after you've assembled and annotated one of your genomes in Patrick, one of the things you probably want to do is look at, compare it to other genomes, and the protein family sorter is a tool that we have to do that. Today, we're going to use an example that is pretty cool. We're going to look at the protein families centered mainly on Buchnera aphidicola. It's a proteobacterium. What's interesting about these things is that they're endosymbionts of aphids, and they um, think that there's been a really long association between this bacterium and its aphid hosts. They think that it's been like between 160 million and 280 million years ago. Their closest uh, relatives are the Enterobacteriaceae, which includes things like E. coli, for those of you who don't know that. They share with E. coli having a gram-negative cell wall, but one of the things they don't have are the genes to produce lipopolysaccharides for the outer membrane. They're very small. This is what makes this absolutely wonderful. They're small and their genomes, not only in size, but also in genome uh, size. They have the smallest known genomes of any living organisms, but they're very genetically stable. And by that, I mean, they are intracellular. They live their whole lives intracellularly and so there's no horizontal transfer. It's only passed through by the mother, mother aphid, when um, it's transmitted to the offspring. In this great uh, genome reduction that they have had, and they're turning on to be, they're sort of like a mitochondrion for, uh, would be the similar things in humans. Buchnera have deleted genes required for a lot of metabolic processes, and some of them that they've deleted are the genes that are important for anaerobic respiration, also genes involved in synthesis of amino acid sugars, fatty acids, phospholipids, and complex carbohydrates. Just to give you, I stole this shamelessly off uh, the internet. The Buchnera are housed in special um, cells in the aphid gut. So here on the far left is a lovely aphid. And, you know, if you saw that on your plant, you might want to squish it. That might be your first inclination, but don't do it because they're so cool. You wouldn't only be squishing the aphids, you'd be squishing the Buchnera, who are the coolest organisms, I'm convinced, now known to man. So in the, in the aphid host, in the gut, they have these cells. And look, this is a blow up of the cell. This is the nucleus of the aphid cell. And see all this stuff in here? All that stuff that's jam packed in, that's all Buchnera. So a vertebrate cell that wasn't in the, in the process of dying would only tolerate this kind of activity or this kind of, give up this kind of real estate to something that was beneficial to it. So for today's webinar, we're gonna discuss things that the Buchnera are doing to help out their, their aphid hosts. Um, first, we're, I'm gonna show you how to find data in Patrick. We're gonna create groups of genomes, so to, I'll show you how to do that so that you can examine them using the protein family sorter. We're gonna do two different kinds of techniques using the protein family sorter. I'm gonna show you how to use uh, protein families that are specific to a genus. And we're also going to look across genera. I'm gonna show you how you can find pathways associated, uh, metabolic pathways associated with differences that you might see in the protein family sorter and we'll generate a multiple sequence alignment. And if we have time, I'll also show you how to um, use the Venn diagram tool in Patrick. So the end result is with, that you can do, this is all stuff I did in Patrick. For people who have joined before, Patrick has a phylogenetic tree um, pipeline. 
So this is the tree I generated. This is our protein heat map. And from the heat map, we'll be able to see what pathways are specific to these different organisms. And, and the Buchnera cluster phylogenetically, we, I found based on the host that they inhabit. So it's what they're giving to each, each of the different hosts. Okay, so let me escape that and go here. And can you all see my screen? We're still looking at the Okay, so I have to go, hold on a second, go into the share and Firefox, share screen. Okay, I know there was a little bobble there, but now we're ready to roll. Okay, so in Patrick, um, we have, you notice there are a bunch of different tabs along the top that show you the organisms, the type of data we have, workspaces, our different services, and the help. And the help can get you to tutorials, but I'll step you through those in a little bit. Let's go back to organisms. NIAD is, of course, very interested in pathogens, so we provide an easy way for people to get to pathogens uh, by going directly to the different genera. But if it, Buchnera is not a pathogen and it's not on this list, how do I find it? Well, you can go in here and search for Buchnera, if you can see up at the top, okay? So I put it in and return. And this is, oh, I was gonna say this can be a slow process, but not today, it seems to be pretty quick. So you see I've got the genomes here. This is the search result page. It's, we've got a summary up here, but you can see we've got the genomes, genomic features, which are the genes or proteins, and the taxa. And you'll notice that it says there are 76 genomes here and 34 here. I'll explain to you exactly what the differences are, but I wanna go to taxa. So let's click on the Buchnera genus. And this takes us to the landing page for this organism. What we try to do in Patrick is give you summaries of the data on the first page, but you notice there are a number of different tabs across the top. We can't fit all the data into one page. So feel free and ex to explore each of the tabs. Today, we're gonna be stepping through the phylogeny tab and the genomes tab. But before we go there, let me note that, show you that Buchnera has a taxonomic ID. This is the GenBank taxon ID. This tells you that it's a genus. genus. This shows you the um, taxonomic structure of it. It's a member of the gamma proteobacteria and the pro proteobacteria. And it's genetic code 11 for those of you who care about those things. Also, you can see that here we have reference and representative genomes. Those are, gen those are distinctions, what are considered maybe the platinum and gold standard genomes that are um, designated by GenBank. They're generally genomes that they think represent a species and have, are high quality. Reference are, would be the platinum standard, representative would be the gold standard. Now you'll notice that if you have looked at bacterial data before, you'll notice that these names look a little strange. Here you've got Buchnera aethicola and then the strain name, and then there's something weird in parentheses there. The naming convention for Buchnera is to include the host that it was isolated from. Remember that they're deeply connected, the two of them, the host and um, the symbiont. So this is makes this Buchnera use case really fun to because you can quickly see how things are structured, not only based on the bacterium, but on the host itself. We also provide metadata. We try to show um, host names, isolation country, and genome status. And any recent papers are also included along the side. We have a a query that goes off to PubMed. So let's click on genomes. 
And right away, you can see it's listing all the Buchnera genomes, and at the bottom it says 70 results. And remember earlier, it didn't say that many. And I can see that there are a lot of genomes here. How do I figure out what I want to choose? There's genome names, the genome ID, genome status, the number of sequences, how many, the Patrick CDSs, which are the number of genes that are called, where it's isolated from the host, and it tells you what year the organism was collected and when the genome was sequenced. Let's click up here on the filters and open it up, and this allows you to quickly get through data. First, let's talk about public. This is telling you which genomes are public and private. I'm logged in. You're seeing my screen. Buchnera is now an obsession of mine, and you can tell these when it says false, it means private. That's computer speak for a private genome. So I have my own genomes there, and the true or the public genome. So I want to sort of imitate what your experience would be. So let's click on true. Now suddenly we only have 58 genomes. So let's look on this a bit. If I scroll down and look at things, you can see that there's complete WGS plasmid. We'll look at the plasmid genes, genomes. They have very few genes. I don't want to look at those. They'll make it, they'll make my protein family sorter look kind of ugly. But I am interested in looking at the complete genomes and the whole genome shotgun, which is WGS. Let me explain briefly what the differences between those two are. When a genome has been labeled as complete, it means that the number of contigs exactly match the number of chromosomes in the organism. So, if, for instance, in this case, this particular genome, which is this uh, Buchnera aphid codal a Aphidicola strain USDA from Mises persicae, that has two sequences. What I know from that, prob what I'm sure is happening here is that there's one chromosome and there's also a plasmid in that one, and that's what the two mean. You can see that in those two, that there are 596 genes called. So compared to a regular bacterial genome, these are amazingly tiny. So I want to look at these things. I want to look, look at these things in the protein family sorter. So I want to create a genome group. And once you do that and you're logged in, you have it forever in, until you get rid of it. And you can look at it whenever you want. Notice this green bar here on the side. There's nothing in there. But if I click here next to genome name, It'll auto-select everything in the group, all of my results, which are the 28 total genomes. And suddenly, it tells me things that I can do once I've made a selection. I can download the data. I can copy it. I can go to a list of those genomes, or I can group the genomes. So if I wanted to group it, which I hope you will want to do, let's click on that. And let's do a new group. And I'll call this Buchnera um, 31 May, because I've created this group several times because I practiced. Okay? So let's add that group. And when I add it, you notice down here at the bottom, it's telling me that it successfully created that group. So we have one group to compare. But you know what? We might want to look at something different than just Buchnera to make it even more interesting. So let's go over here and click on the phylogeny tab. Patrick provides for most organisms an order level tree. So we, try, we don't get all the genomes because right now we have uh, close to 150,000 genomes. But we try to create trees with what we consider to be high quality genomes and include them all in a tree. You can see this is a massive tree. It's not 16S, it's shared protein families. So one of the reasons we do this is so that if you have data or if you don't know who to compare things to, you can easily find things that you can compare the data to, um, your data to, by looking at our tr 
the trees here. So you can see here are the Bufnera. They're all here and they go down here. So if I wanted to compare it to something, I want something that's kind of along this clade. So I can click here. And over here, sorry, I'm gonna have to move this down because I can't see it. You notice when I selected that, uh, that group, it allowed me to create a new group. So I wanna compare my book narrow to these guys. They're kind of close relatives. So I do the group. I want it to be a new group and it's block mania. And let me tell you something about this guy. This is so cool. Uh, let's, there, the group was created, Block Mania. Block Mania are also endo, endosymbionts that have been isolated from carpenter ants. So within this particular clade, we have a bunch of organisms with very reduced genomes. So you could, you would assume, if from thinking about um, phylogeny, that this capability was that there was some, you know, endosymbiont developed early on, and then these guys specialized within it. So I want to click um, Wigglesworthia. All right, and we're going to do something a little different with this one because we only have one example of this. And let me tell you that Wigglesworthia, and I, oh, sorry, I didn't tell you, I clicked on the genome tab because I want to go to the data summarized about this. You can see it's called Wizzle, Wigglesworthia glossinia, the endosymbiont of glossinia brevipalpus. All right, hold on your socks. Glossinia brevipalpus is the tsetse fly, which I'm sure probably you've heard about. It's the agent generally of African sleeping sickness. So this thing is an endosymbiont of that, but I want more than one of, the, of the, this genome. So you can see this across the top. This is the breadcrumb that um, shows me the taxonomy of the organism. I can click here to collect Wigglesworthia, and we only have two of those genomes in Patrick. So I want to create a group of this. So I go into genomes, I collect them both, I go to group, I create a new group, and I'm going to call it Wigglesworthia uh, 31 May. All right. Add. Now, how do I know that Patrick actually added any of those groups? I can tell that by going into my workspace and clicking on my genome groups. Now, I use Patrick a lot. I've got a ton of groups. If I wanted to see my most recent one, I click on created here and it'll sort them from most re recent to least, least recent. So you can see that here are the two genomes for Wigglesworthia, the three for Blockmania, and the 28 for Buchnera. So now let's do some comparison. To use Patrick's Protein Family Sorter tool, we need to go up into Services and then click on the Protein Family Sorter. You can add in genomes individually, which I'll show you later, but I'll just show you that you can, by clicking on this filter, you can drill down and select specific groups to make your selection um, easier. Now, I want to do genome group because I went up to a lot of trouble to create this deep genome group. So I'm going to do Bucnera 31 May. And you notice this button isn't enabled yet. It'll turn blue when I can, when I can do it. So I need to do something to enable this. You notice both of these arrows here, you need to click on that to move it here so that it, it's telling the tool search these genomes. And now the um, box is blue. However, I want to point out the Patrick, the family types. Patrick has um, three different flavors of protein families. We have genus specific families that we build on um, specific genera. And we have cross genus families. And we also have functional families. 
So because these are all Buchnera, let's click on the genus-specific families called PL fans. And I'm going to search on that. Well, that was fast. What? I, okay, hold on. I, what I, usually it takes a while. If you, I wanted to tell you if you have questions about our protein families, which are built using KMERS, I would refer you to this publication. So here we are. We've got all the Buchnera. It says that we have 28 genomes here. And let's talk a little bit about this page. We've got a filter here on the side, and we've got the resulting table. It says that in these 28 genomes, there are 1,431 protein families. That would be the pan genome. Anybody who does uh, comparative analysis of any genome group, generally you uh, report the pan genome, the core genome, and the accessory genome. So right now I'm going to show you how to do that in Patrick. So notice up here we have three filter bars, present in all families, which is the first column, absent from all families, which is the second column, and either mixed, which is the third column. Let's click present in all families. And notice now we're down to 180 of those 1,431. So this is telling me that there are very, there aren't that many protein that, proteins that all of these 28 genomes share. Um, but there are a lot of what I'd call accessory genomes. If you wanted to look at um, genes that are specific to an individual genome, I would click on absence and then click on present in this family. And I can see that this first guy, and who is this guy? If I hover over and I move him, I can see who it's isolated from. This particular Buchnera has 34 protein families or 34 genes that nobody else has. This one isolated from Cynara confinus has three. So that just gives you a, a way to look at that. So how do I figure out the accessory genome? Well, you can do the math, 1431 minus 108. Or you could come down here and filter on the number of genomes from 1 to 27, because those will be the ones that aren't shared by everyone and filter that, and I can see that there are 1,251 uh, protein families that are part of the accessory genome. So let's reset this. Now let's say that there's uh, one of these protein families that I'm deeply interested in that I want to look at. This is the protein family ID, and this will, tells me that 21 of the genomes have this protein family. There are 30 proteins amongst these 21 genomes in this protein family. This is the functional description or name of the protein family. This is the smallest amino acid. This is the biggest. And we also provide the mean and the standard deviation. If I wanted to look at this protein family specifically, I would click on it here and it tells you a number of things you can do here. You can see map to different IDs. You can get a pathway summary. You can download it. You can get the sequence. You could build a MSA. You could see who the members are. You could create a group. Let's just quickly uh, click on the MSA just so you can see that. And while it's loading, let me describe to you what you're going to see when it does load. Along the left side of the of the page, you'll see the gene tree that shows you how those genes are clustered together. And then across the center, you'll see a multiple sequence alignment um, that uh, will be in very nice color. And across the top, it'll have something that we call web logo so that you can see how conserved the amino acids are. So here's the gene tree across the side, and notice that they are clustering, phylogenetically clustering according to the host that they're isolated from. And you can also see that some of them are in terrible shape, and some of them, you know, looks like this is, this um, is missing it. But if you notice, 
Tuck seven is here and tuck seven is here. What I suspect is happening here, and if this was a longer webinar, we'd go into it, is that this gene is actually pseudogenized in these genomes, that these are actually two pieces of the same genome. And if I went in and looked at the ID type, you can see that this is 210 and this is 211 from the same genome ID, I believe. Oh, 209 and 210. So I think that those are pseudogenized. So that's the kind of power that you can do with some of the things in Patrick. Okay, so I wanna take that guy off. We're going back to this. So this is a lot of data. You could download it, you could put it in Excel, you could explore it, but let me draw your attention to the heat map, which is here. We're all primates. Everyone uh, watching the webinar is a primate this guy because I need to see my tools. And we respond to different colors. So we try to um, make differences visible to you using this heat map. You notice that genomes are down the side. They're in alphabetical order. And across the top are protein families. If you grab this slider and move it, you can see the names of the individual protein families. Now, what do these colors mean? If I go up and I click on the legend, it tells me that in this particular genome, because the cell is black, this protein is not annotated. Up above in the first row, this protein has one copy of that protein. This genome has one copy of that protein. This kind of mustard color, this genome has two copies of this protein. And this guy down here, this tangerine color, this particular genome has three or more copies of this particular protein. So this is a way you can quickly get a sense of changes and differences between genomes. I'm gonna pull the slider back and I'm gonna close the heat map view. So there are ways to explore this data and we have a couple of tools to do it. I'm not gonna clip click on flip the axis, but I will click on cluster. And what this does is it will reorder the genomes and the protein families based on a clustering algorithm. And you can see that things have changed now. Look along the side here. Everything that's isolated from Cynaria is in the top. And look at the differences here. These are all the protein families that all of these things have together. But out here are all the things that these guys have lost. And over here, they have some things that they have uniquely. But let me point out, you know, these are all the same um, species of bacteria, genus and species of bacteria. But what they have retained and what they have lost has matters very much to the aphid that they are part of, that they are endosymbionts on. So you can assume that Cynaria doesn't need any of this stuff that something like Mises persicae relies on and that it, the bacteria is providing to its aphid host. So look, here's this Mises persicae here along the side. And if you look here in this part, they have something that really nobody else has. Now, I could open up the slider so I could see the names and scroll all the way down where, oh, here they are, and then try to read those. And they're at like a 90 degree angle and it's gonna get me a headache. I don't wanna do that. And what am I supposed to do? Write it all down? I don't think so. So we have a way in Patrick that takes it from a visualization that allows you to capture the data underneath it. So this will be hard to see, but I'll do it slowly. You can see that my cursor is moving through here. So I'll draw a big box with my cursor around these genes. Maybe you can see me doing it here, but you just use your cursor to do that. And then Patrick will give you some choices. It says, do you want to download the heat map data? I mean, you can do this. It won't be a pretty picture. 
it'll just give you the lists and it'll show them as the list of genomes and it'll say one, two, or three in them. So sometimes that's useful. You can download the proteins, show the proteins, add them to a group or cancel. I want to see those proteins. So I click on show the proteins. And look here, these are the proteins. Let's look at this again. These are the proteins that the Buscnera that are part of Mysis persicae, a specific aphid, those are the proteins that those guys have that nobody else has. None of the other Buscnera have. And as I look down, oh man, there's a lot of hypothetical, but I see these with, that have EC number. EC stands for enzyme commission number. It's a general indication that this protein has metabolic function. So how do, I, how do I find out what pathways are involved? Well, we have a great tool for that. Look along the green bar, nothing there, but if I click here, it will select all the, um, all the proteins or genes. We use proteins and genes interchangeably in Patrick here. And notice I can download them, I can copy them, I could go to the feature page, I could go back to genomes, I could get all the sequences, I would build an M MSA. I would not do that at this point because that'd be a very bad idea. Let's go to pathway summary. Now this generally takes a while. So let's see, should I, while we're waiting for the pathway summary to load, this will be one of the slowest things that you do in Patrick because what it's doing is it's taking your genes and it's looking across all the pathway data, peg, uh, Patrick has keg data, so it's looking across all of that to um, try to summarize that data for you. So while we wait, while I wait for that to load, I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Paul Buckner. <laughs> he was an entomologist back in the 1800s, and he is considered to be the uh, father of, um, of symbiosis. He really discovered it. He liked uh, cutting apart insects and looking at their cells. And he noted that. Here's a pa paper that talks about it. Incidentally, Nancy Moran, who was at the University of Arizona, I think she's at Yale now, she won a MacArthur Genius Award by her study of Buchnera. So we're still waiting for this. But you know what? I've already loaded this earlier. So I'm going to let this keep spinning and I'll show you what one would see in the pathway summary. So this is what would, oh, it's returned. So sorry to give you whiplash here. So what returns is the keg pathway names here and it tells me the number of genes from my selection the number of genes annotated in the path in the pathway normally and how much of the pathway is covered by this. So I want to see what has the most. So if I click on this, it goes smallest to largest. If I click on number of genes selected again, it shows me the most to the least. Folate biosynthesis. Folate's important. Um, it gives you vitamins. Uh, so let's look at that. If I click on that, you see, I can look at the pathway map here. All right, so let's load this. Ah, beautiful. Okay, along the side, it shows me the EC number, how many genomes have it in each genome, how many genes there are, how many genomes don't have it. We'll do another uh, webinar at one point on our comparative pathway viewer and how often it occurs in the pathway. Let's click on the legend over here. For those of you who don't know much about keg, if the box like this is white, it means it's not in the genome. If the box is this lime green color, it means it has been annotated in the genome. And the blue ones are the ones from our selection. So let's just step through this really quickly again. We had the heat map. We selected these genes and we got this list. We clicked on all of those and said, I want to see the pathway summary. How many of those genes are in pathways? Five of those genes were in the folate biosynthesis pathway, which I could see here. And you might say, wait, there's more than five there. 
this particular enzyme, this 3.5.4.16, is in four different places in this genome, in this genome. So it's doing a whole bunch of functionality with this, and then these are the others. So those are the five genes. Now let me point out that since the beginning of, uh, back, I found some papers back in the 70s that were looking at these aphids and they were trying to starve them. So they would, well, they wanted to see, um, I, I'm not really sure what, who knows why these whacked out entomologists do this kind of stuff, but they started putting aphids on reduced diets and they noticed that they could, if you cut most insects, if you cut folate from their diet, they'll die. These aphids were doing just fine and it's because of this endosymbiont and it was predicted in the 1970s that they must have some endosymbiont that's providing that for them. Okay, so we've got this. This is a pretty cool story and we've looked at those specific differences, but let's look at something else. So let's go into services and do the protein family sorter and this time I want to compare all three groups that I did, to, did today. The Wigglesworthia is from tsetse flies, Lachmania is from carpenter ants, and Buchnera. Now I have three here, three different genera. So I don't want to do the PL fams, the genus specific families, I want to do the PG fams so I can look at the cross genome families. So let's load that. And once again, that was pretty quick. There are 1,704 protein families. Now let me show you some pretty cool ways that you can play with this when you have multiple um, genera here. If I wanted to quickly see all the protein families that were in Wigglesworthia, first I would click, click absent and all, and then I would click these two. And I can see pretty quickly, oh, here are all the protein families that Wigglesworthia have that everybody else lacks, okay? If I wanted to see what it shares with Blockmania, I could click all of that. So they have 453 protein families that Buchnera lacks. If I wanted to see what Buchnera has that these guys are missing, I could go in and do that kind of clicking and see what they were. So the, this, uh, this filter along the side is very powerful and you can use it a number of different ways. But now I wanna see the either a mixed thing. And now we notice you have PG families as opposed to PL families. So we've stepped through that. Let's go directly to the heat map. All right, so this is in alphabetical order. If I open it up, you can see the Buchneris are at the top. Another way you can see it is look at this blue bar up here as I scroll over things and you can see we're in Buchnera but then suddenly up oh, it changes to Blockmania, Blockmania and then Wigglesworthia, Wigglesworthia. Now last time we did a cluster, this time let's do an advanced cluster just because I want to show you that we have different tools in Patrick and if there are things you like better, different clustering algorithms we try to enable it. So I'm a big fan of Euclidean distance. Actually, I'm not that big a fan of it, but I like the name, so I chose it. I changed the linkage to complete linkage, and I'll submit that. And what this is going to do is cluster things based on that algorithm. And if we open this up again, you'll see all the Buchnera are there, and it's pretty much similar. This is the one, these are the ones isolated from Mises. These are the ones that were isolated from Scenaria. But here now we have things that are isolated from Blockmania and also Wigglesworthia. So I want to collect, this is in Blockmania, I want to collect this big thing here. All right. And I want to show those proteins. I want to see what those proteins are that big thing that's in Blockmania. And so remember that I'm looking at genes that Blockmania has that um, the ones from Buchnera do not have. So I click on that and I want to do one, yet again a pathway summary. 
So what, as we know, this, oh, it didn't take long at all. Sometimes it can be really quick. So let's click on the number of genes selected again. And look, we have a bunch of genes in lipopolysaccharide and a bunch of genes in purine metabolism. I just want to show you another feature we have in Patrick. So yes, I can go to the pathway map, which I will, but I want to create a group of these genes because I want to see if Blockman, if these two genomes share the same, these two pathways share the same enzyme. So I'm going to click on the group and this time I'm creating a feature group and I'm going to call it a new group and I'm going to call it block um, LPS for lipopolysaccharide genes. And remember that these, there it added, and look, let's just step ourselves through what we're doing. These are the genes in Blockmania that it has that the Buchnera don't have. Wigglesworth, one of the Wigglesworth strains, or the Wigglesworth strains have uh, some of those things, okay? And those were the genes, and this is the pathway summary. I want to do the same with the, the purine metabolism, create a group. I want to create a new group, and I'm going to call it block purine genes from the selection, okay? And I'll show you what you can do with that in a minute. But let's go back to that lipopolysaccharide because I'm particularly interested in that. And why am I interested in it? Because I know that it's been proven or it's been written about that Buchnera are missing all the genes for lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis. And when we looked at the heat map, I have to wait till that silly thing goes away. But when we look at the heat map, those genes are somewhere in this group, which all of the Buchnera are missing, okay? And these were the genes, pathway summary, and here's the pathway map. So you can see that, the, that uh, Blockmania has these genes that everybody else is missing. Uh, or that Buchnera is missing, which had been known earlier. So it's a way to confirm that. So let me show you something else you can do in Patrick. Remember when we were back here and I said, well, are these the same genes? Because often you'll find, you know, there are genes in different pathways and are they really unique? They do, you know, are they the same gene in different pathways? I don't know, I wanna find that out. So remember, I created two different groups. Let's go into my workspace. Let's look at my feature group. Now, I have a huge number of features. So it's going to take a little while to load. You can see I've been doing this since 2011. I want to get a more recent feature group. So these are my block mania purine genes, and I'm going to select both of them. When I select both of them, look, the Venn diagram pops up. And the Venn diagram will look across each of these feature groups to tell me if anything, if it shares anything, if anything's similar. So look at this. The purine genes and the LPS genes are totally unique. So what that's saying is that within this group of genes, within this group that we selected from Blockmania, there are two different sets of um, enzymes, well, probably more too, but those are independent and the, the genes that are involved in the LPS synthesis are not, whoops, sorry, I can't remember where my Venn diagram went. Sorry, sorry, there we go. The genes involved in purine metabolism are not the same genes involved in LPS synthesis. Okay, so we could go in and we could look at other things. We could choose things that were specific to Wigglesworthia, things like that. But what I want to do instead is this is a pretty small number of genomes. And so let's try something bigger. So let's go into the protein family sorter and I want to show you some different functionality. I've created a couple of groups. Brucella is something I'm quite fond of. And this is 169 genomes. 
and also I created a group of 200 genomes of brucella. So I still have some room here. I want to add something different. I know in neither of these groups, I don't have my favorite genome, which is brucella microti. So if I am unclear of which one it is, I can just start writing and you can see that Patrick is trying to, to give me hints of, to try to help me in this. I want the representative brucella microti genome. You can tell because of these, these are my private genomes with these little blocks. I work on brucella a lot. That's before I became a great fan of Bucnera, but now I've seen the light. So here's brucella microti and what do I have to do? It's not here. I have to move that over. So one group had 169 genomes. One group has 199 genomes, and then there's poor little old Brucella microti. Because they're all, um, sorry, because they're all Brucella, I'm going to click on the genus specific families so that I can look at the protein families there. It'll work if you do, if you do the global families, the cross genus families, that'll work just fine. It's just that I uh, like to do this. Now, some, the, sometimes this takes a while because it's a big group. We, we were close up to, you know, we're, we're hitting 400 genomes, close to that. And that generally is, I've tweaked it and I've gotten just above 400. The heat map views in Patrick are generally supposed to be limited to 400 genomes, but we can do things that you can play with it. You can test the limits to see how high you can get. So <clears throat> here, once again, is the filter. Here's the table. But I want to show you something that I didn't show you before. So let's click on the heat map view. And this will take a while to load because it's a large number of genomes. And you can see, oh my goodness, lot, we've got 300 genomes here, right? Ugh. It's a, little, a lot more than Bucnera. Remember how Bucnera was? There were so few genomes um, and how small they were and how fast it was for that. Well, I must admit I ran this earlier today, so it's cached, so it goes a little bit quicker. But so we've got all of these genomes, 368 genomes and uh, a number of protein families. This is a function I didn't didn't tell you about. This is called anchoring a genome. So you can click on that and then select a genome. So let's just, this also gives you an indication of how many genomes are in here. It goes on forever. But remember when I added microti, it's all alphabetical. I'm going to choose Brucella microti. Now while this is going, I'm going to describe to you what uh, anchoring a genome means. It means it's taking the Brucella microti genome, which is actually in two, it's a complete genome in two contexts. So it's starting at the first called gene, and then it's arranging all the protein families based on that gene. Then it goes to the second one and the third one. So it's arranging all the protein families based on the order that they occur in Brucella microti. Now, what I haven't told you about, about Brucella, which it's, you know, I, okay, I really like Bucnera, but I also like Brucella because they have something in common. Generally, they cluster based on, they have a host preference. So they cluster on the things, phylogenetically cluster on the hosts that they're isolated from. Up here, we have a whole bunch of Brucella abortus. Abortus are generally isolated from cattle. Melitensis from goats. Uh, we'll have SETI, at, which is from whales, believe it or not. Pinnipedialis from seals. Ovis from sheep. And then, we, actually, Brucella's gotten pretty interesting because we have a lot of, they've just recently discovered that they've been isolated from um, things like frogs and fish. So we're learning a lot more about Brucella. But this is oriented based on Brucella microti, which was isolated from a mouse, okay? 
So you can see that some of these things are found in some of the brucella and not. For example, this big section here, if I look over it in the black part, it tells me that the isolates from sheep, ovus, are lacking this. So I want to find out what that is. You've already guessed it. I draw a box around it. It's a little harder in these things. And then I tell it to show me those proteins to see what those are that the brucella isolated from sheep lack, but the ones, and actually it was only the sheep are missing this, and it just happened to be this particular one. And then we can click on pathway again. And if we, once again, want to see the most of it, ah, valine, leucine, and isoleucine degrada degradation. So if I wanted to look on the, the map for that, and go in and look at that, ah, I mean, actually that's pretty beautiful, pretty amazing. So what does this tell us? This tells us that most of the brucella, except for these guys, have those genes. They're required. Bacteria just don't keep things around like we do in our closets. Generally, they get rid of things that they don't need or they accrue mutations in it. However, these particular genes are all missing in ovus. Ovus infects sheep, so, and it successfully infects sheep. So something about those, that association, or perhaps this strain just lost it, but that tells you a striking dif difference between the two that you can use doing the protein family sorter to explore these kinds of differences. Let me show you one last thing. I want to, I neglected to show you something earlier. So, oh, well, Ron is telling me. No, go ahead. Here, let me show you one more thing that I can show you. Um, I can click a number of genes this way that I want to look at, and I can say show those proteins. From here, I can also do an MSA. The MSA is generally limited, I'm sorry, the multiple sequence alignment is generally limited to around 200 um, genes that we can do at a time, but I just wanted to point out that you can do it not just from the table, but you can select data from the heat map view. And I guess I selected all melatensis there. I was trying to be careful. And there's some canis ones and the abortus ones. And so you can see that these are um, the, a multiple sequence alignment. You can toggle between the gene ID and the genome name, which is you can filter based on color, but this is probably, this is pretty cool too. I love the um, multiple sequence alignment and we provide a lot of different colors there that you can go in and change the colors for it. So whatever, you know, whatever, whatever colors you like, we probably have something that will um, suit your fancy. So I think we're coming up on the hour for the end of the webinar. I'd like to open it up. If you have any questions, um, you can let me know. Um, while I wait to see if anybody asks any questions, let me point out that when in need, you can always, there are several ways to get help. First is to click the help button and you can contact us. Well, actually, you, you can here, click on this, and that will generate an email where you can say, help me, help, I need help. Um, so don't save that. You can go in, we also provide tutorials and user guides. So the tutorials, you can go in here and if I want to see how to annotate a genome in Patrick, we have step-by-step -step ways that show you how to do that. 
by going to help here and I want to see user guides, this will be more for the protein family sorter kind of thing. But you could go in and look through those and it'll help you um, do a user guide for the protein family sorter, step you through that. Also, and we'll be posting this webinar as well, we have a phylogenetic tree building, proteome comparison tool, and the metagenomic binning service. Okay, and um, today we'll have the protein family sorter. We're also going to be digging down more deeply into Patrick's command line interface. For those of you who are more comfortable with doing uh, things via command line and you don't like clicking as much as the rest of us, uh, that might be a good option. Okay, I, there's a, uh, yes, a question has been asked if we can show the protein families. It's this paper um, by Jim Davis. James Davis is the first author. You can see that I'm on it. It's in Frontiers. You can also find the Patrick page. Oh yeah, you can also find it from the Patrick page that'll list that. But this is the paper that the protein families are based on. Well, I can't remember it's where like to find it. Icon on the far right. On the, okay, hold on. The hamburger icon. Yeah. Oh, that you call that a hamburger? That's what it's called. Okay. So, Publication. publications. So, what is, I now know is the hamburger icon, which I just thought were three dashes. Now you, know. <laughs> you can click on publications and it will show you the different publications that we've had and the Patty Fams with Davis is right here. So, that provides you a direct link. You click on that and that opens up the page and ta-da! There it is. You've got the thing that you can read it and then um, decide if you like it or not. But it's all part of Patrick. When we annotate the genomes, we also assign our protein families so that you can enable this kind of analysis.